it's uh, ideas with beers. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, 23rd of February. Last week's edition is up on YouTube here. Um, send me your information and queries. Uh, if you want the slides immediately, just email me there on Chair RDRF. Uh, no general theme this week. Um, I'm conscious of the fact that uh, time marches on. It might be a, a occasion in March to say what has really happened over the last year, but we'll do that next month, I think. Um, a sort of general review, perhaps, of where we are and um, what's good and what's bad. Uh, this is not strictly active travel, but uh, here's something from the good people at Possible. Tell the government to protect trains rather than planes. Uh, something from Giulio Mattioli, who uh, is often on this group, uh, worthwhile following. Uh, here's some things. In a car dependent transport system, Hidden subsidies to car infrastructure and the dominance of the car over public space are so prevalent that they're seen as normal and fair. Road building maintenance seen as basic political common sense, an apolitical facade around pro-car decision making. Um, and those who question the status quo are often depicted as lacking common sense, realism, etc. Uh, this whole point about how things are seen as natural, um, the background assumptions is something that we constantly attack in, from the road danger reduction point of view, uh, essential to avoid false equivalences, uh, the neutralizing of the difference in potential lethality between different modes of transport. Uh, and so Julia is talking about that kind of thing, and he does that in an article here, the political economy of car dependence, a systems of provision approach, which he's written with uh, Julia Steinberger, who you should uh, also look at if you're interested in climate change, which you must be. Um, okay, here's a survey from uh, the Institute of Advanced Motorists, IAM Road Smart. It's got some slightly wonky numbers in it, and I wouldn't take too much from it, but nevertheless, a couple of thousand motorists surveyed. 43% uh, thought it was acceptable to drive up to 80 miles an hour on a motorway. 25% uh, admitted driving over 80 miles an hour. 23% thought it even uh, it was acceptable to drive even faster than that. 20% acceptable to drive five miles per hour over the speed limit on a residential street. Doesn't say whether 20 or 30 miles an hour. Uh, and nearly 10% thought it was acceptable to drive at those speeds outside a school. Um, this is slightly funny. 14% admit to having driven at more than 10% over the speed limit in residential areas. Uh, whereas the figures would indicate that that's a lot more than 14%. And this is despite 89% of respondents believing speeding in a re residential area is as much of a threat to their safety, which is different from the safety as other people, as driving under the influence of illegal drugs. Uh, Yes, don't forget the budget's coming up. Uh, here's a nice little hashtag, raise fuel duty, put out there by the Transport Action Network people. Um, that's certainly what I would like to see. Uh, and I would see, like to see a lot more smart road user charging and all the rest. Right, I'm going to repeat the slides from last week about air quality because there's a lot of important stuff coming out. Uh, this is the study from Imperial College, which gives us the new figures uh, of uh, deaths from NO2 and small particles in London to around the 4,000 mark uh, for 2019. It's that which you should um, get hold of and use as your reference. And uh, there's also the uh, 8.7 million deaths globally in 2018 um, reference there. 
and uh, the EFRA committee report from British Lung Foundation and webinar featuring Dr. Gary Fuller. Uh, just flagging those up again this week. Right, the wild low traffic neighborhood drivel of the week comes from uh, someone in Chiswick. Uh, there will be a revolt. I won't vote for anybody in the election who admits to being a cyclist. Uh, apologies to all those cyclists who don't agree with the London cycling campaign agenda of world domination and its oppression and make Chiswick great again. Oh, God. Um, I think there's a bit more drivel. Yes, this is from the John Lewis partnership submission to the, uh, uh, the Parliamentary Committee on e-scooters. And they oppose them saying uh, curbside cycle lanes are increasing and we have to use more vehicles. The cycle lanes can increase delivery times by up to 40%. Uh, which uh, there's no evidence for that, they didn't produce it. And in the same parliamentary committee, we have the Brewery Logistics Group saying more or less the same thing. But this time cycle lanes can increase delivery times by up to 50%. And nice thing about e-scooters, e you know I'm not a fan, but even I wouldn't say e-scooters can exceed 30 miles an hour. No, they can't and pose a real safety threat to delivery teams. Um, uh, no, so a bit more drivel there. And oh yeah, here's something else. It's not news, but it did come up and it's relevant. Uh, the cycle to work scheme is now unlimited in how much you can spend on a bike. It used to be a thousand pounds max. Um, meaning savings of about 25% plus can also be got on e-bikes and cargo bikes. But you have to be in the cycle to work scheme. Uh, as Mark Strong said, it only applies to employed people. If you're self-employed, you can only claim tax relief on a bike if it's used exclusively for work. And he says this time it was changed, I agree. And also the employer, if you're going to be uh, under the cycle to work scheme has to be part of the cycle to work scheme and you get money back through salary sacrifice. It's basically a kind of middle class thing and it can be helpful, but there are various limitations on it. Um, right, now this made news in uh, Coventry. Uh, motorists will be paid up to £3,000 to give up their cars. Um, and that's the scheme in Coventry. I raised the issue of what about those of us who've already given up cars or didn't have cars in the first place um, and may also be doing something like a mobility credit scheme in Hampshire. Uh, and uh, this really shows how dreadful Ed Edmund King of the AA can be uh, saying instead, uh, give us um, some more money for electric charging rather than that and you know about the problems with electric cars. Uh, okay, stuff to read. Um, Police and Crime Commissioner elections, I've mentioned before, the absolute zero uh, video by Julian Orwood, which you should see. This is new um, uh, article by uh, John Burke on LTNs in Hackney, or the first of his two articles. Uh, the good article by Laura Laker on bike thefts and it's a very good quote from a police officer saying that um, stopping bikes from being stolen or making sure they're recovered quickly is very important because active travel is important and if people's bicycles are stolen they won't be able to cycle. Uh, so a very good quote from him, do read that in The Guardian. Um, you know about the Uber judgment. Uh, I'm interested from a transport point of view. Um, it would be interesting to see if the cost of using Ubers goes up and that might mean fewer Ubers around uh, because they are involved in uh, a, a lot of congestion in London and it's not just uh, the cabbies who are saying that. 
Um, yes, go to Better Streets for Kensington and Chelsea. They've got a new action up. I'll refer to that a bit later. Uh, a new thread by Mark Hodson, who is here, uh, on why polite signs for drivers don't work. Uh, my review of Peter Walker's book, which you should read. Um, uh, Transport Action Network crowdfunder and Glasgow's History of Liverpool Neighbourhoods and uh, Joe Dunkley on Targets. Some more to read. Uh, Kat Swanson mentioned this last week uh, and peddled me doing cargo bike training for businesses. Uh, it's a new webinar on cycle freight on, oops, March the 16th. Uh, right, now this is your absolutely must read in the current local transport today by Professor Phil Goodwin. And I did um, talk about targets a couple of weeks ago, Joe Dunkley's article, and you really, really must read this. Uh, second part of John Buck's piece on car dominance is here. Uh, right, yes, some really dreadful stuff telling small kids to wear high vis and wear helmets when they're scooting. Um, this is a Department for Transport YouTube video, and you should have a look at it just to see that this is how the messages got over that the roads belong to cars and it stays with those kids uh, for ages. Um, tomorrow, uh, Active Travel Islington webinar, uh, the Department of Transport evidence on switching to sustainable transport mentioned before, the Foundation for Integrated Transport Call mentioned before, Alexi Sales, YouTube videos. And new is the Cycling and Dutch National Infrastructure book, which you can look at. Uh, also, there is a, a, web, a set of webinars from uh, Possible on car-free megacities coming up. Uh, diversity page. Um, nothing new. I'm going to put up a Sarah Bed Berry's um, uh, graphic there because uh, it's good about um, uh, people who are bigger can ride bicycles. The delay slide is now the what's happening slide and nothing new, nothing new about Active Travel England or part six road traffic act 2004 dragging on i put these slides up every week just to show you that nothing new has happened here right this is from last week uh just repeat uh co2 emissions from road transport have risen um thanks to transport action network uh, good news about uh, Stonehenge Tunnel. Um, uh, campaign has granted a high court hearing. There's a big piece in Kent Online about um, Kent County Council's removal of the pop-up cycle lanes, uh, claiming they were unpopular. I don't know how unpopular they were. Nice one from Avon and Somerset Police show that they've uh, been enforcing 20 mile an hour. Uh, there gets up to 2000 notices of intended prosecution. NIPs, as you will know, if you are into third party reporting, which you should be. Right, uh, comments uh, from Tim Phoebe. York seems to be going its own way on cycling and resisting LTN 120. Recent traffic signal improvement at this junction narrowed the existing cycle lane and removed colored surfacing. No consideration of seg segregated or separate lanes as outlined in LTN 120. Glasgow Contrafo cycle lanes have been axed in Deniston low traffic neighborhood. Read that article. Nottingham, uh, as you know, I'm not a big fan of e-scooters, but if you do have them, don't have the parking on the 
road like that it's really not allowing enough room for for um uh prams and whatnot uh yeah here's something from tom uh tom jones about northampton rushmere road uh he says you know basically they're not really widening the cycle lane properly they're not really reallocating road space there's no provision in the direction where cyclists need separation the most uh counting is being done wrong um uh and basically no real effort uh also orcas again we've talked about how people can park cars over orcas and they've gone in and they won't be enough so he says congratulations on doing it badly twice um he's not wild about what northamptonshire seemed to get up to and not surprising um graphic from sefton uh, interesting and so different kinds of bicyclists and they were talking about this number of cycle trips that have been made after a pop-up cycle lane went up last year and um, I wanted to see it compared with last year before um, sorry this was from this year the count I wanted to see how it compared with the previous January but I haven't been able to get figures from them um, Newcastle, oh yeah, fuss about how uh, the consultation, uh, there was an attempt to rig the consultation, that's the consultation over the bridge closures in Newcastle, which uh, Carlton Reed has talked about. Uh, uh, some trolls managed to get into the consultation and uh, have lots of people um, apparently opposing who weren't real people. In Gloucestershire, I haven't put the plans up for the Gloucester Cheltenham Cycleway, didn't get funding from the Department for Transport because it's not in line with LTN 120. And so the council has been saying this is not fair and we do want the money. So we're appealing that we want the money, even though they haven't fulfilled the most um, uh, well stated instructions on what the criteria required are. Bolton Cyclops Junction has gone in. There you go. Right now in Sheffield, here's some comments by David Bamford, who's here tonight. Uh, here's uh, the three um, schemes. This one, Kellam and Pittsmoor, it says really good across the board. Lots of traffic reduction, lots of space for pedestrians and cyclists. There's also the Sheffield First Dutch Roundabout on West Bar. Um, uh, various people have said it's not a Dutch roundabout or it could be a Dutch roundabout or if you look at certain features it's a sort of uh, Dutch roundabout but um, I'm not getting into that I don't know the full details. Uh, second scheme he thinks is quite a poor scheme a lot of shared space um, segregated lanes give up um, and it's a, the current link is of mixed quality on road or indirect off road. And finally, there's a good leisure route, the Upper Don Trail. Uh, so there's some comments from David Bamford in Sheffield. Manchester, this was interesting. Uh, Manchester City Council, which is running a public consultation on how to save 50 million pounds spent £70,000 on some of England's top planning barristers to fight a community group called Trees Not Cars. And they won uh, the, the uh, fight to build uh, a car park next to a school. Uh, so uh, that's quite an interesting little story. Now in London, same old story about uh, the Bishopsgate judgment um nothing new there don't know about the tfl appeal as yet uh so nothing new there will norman has talked about some recent developments in london uh a new scheme filling the bridge between tooley street and tower bridge uh a crucial gap being filled between allgate and uh tower hill 
with a bi-directional track on Mansell Street. I think I mentioned that last week. Um, upgrading of CS7, uh, easier to get between Oval and Streatham with new bus lanes, turning restrictions. The plan for Streatham Hill I showed you a couple of weeks ago, bi-directional there. And he pointed out there's now 300 school streets in London. I mean, that's way better than what we did with, with years of, of uh, school travel plans and whatnot. But don't forget, it's still only 10% and the situation outside London is much worse. Right, now here's an interesting planning application. Got this from Luke of Last Not Lost. Uh, City of London are really, really good about uh, planning requirements for cycle parking. And these developers, British Land, have put in this uh, planning application and it's interesting to see what they're suggesting they want. Um, a total of 1,422 long stay cycle spaces, 100 short stay cycle spaces with this nice ramp to get you into the cycle parking. Um, and I've got a picture of one of the uh, plans just to show how much is there and that they're catering for disabled cyclists and recumbent bicycles. And all the links are here. Uh, if you want to tell your local authority um, what can be required in terms of necessary cycle parking provision, uh, look at these um, uh, committee papers and uh, the, the uh, file for the planning department. Uh, Richmond uh, protected cycle lane on Q Road is to be extended. Uh, now Richmond Park, this was an interesting uh, result. This uh, gentleman apparently uh, bumped into a cyclist, no the cyclist didn't cause that, and then swerved off the road, uh, hit one of the barriers, I think that could be it, and a tree. So uh, the suggestion we raise is that certainly after he hit the cyclist, um, possibly he moved his foot from the brake to the accelerator, but uh, he was not going at under the 20 mile an hour speed limit, which applies in Richmond Park. Um, uh, Lewisham, right, this is uh, responses back to one of their consultations, what you've told us, and oh dear, walking and cycling should be encouraged to go away, uh, improving routes between parks and open spaces. I'm not sure if, if this was about them not putting more adventurous questions down or whether that's because nobody actually suggested anything more adventurous but it's a bit underwhelming right now ealing a uh, couple of points first point um in between 7th of december last year and 11th of january you know, you know it was about five weeks nearly six thousand uh PCNs were issued, which if the full face value were paid would bring in three quarters of a million pounds. And general feeling is that we don't want LTNs to work by having cameras, we'd rather have good quality engineering. Nevertheless, this, this would indicate that a lot of people are just uh, stupid when they're driving their cars um, past the signage. Um, another point about uh, Ealing LTNs, which I read today, I'm not really quite sure what's happening here, but it says in from Transport uh, Extra, uh, a local transport today, a, lo a legal challenge brought against five LTNs in Ealing has been abandoned after the council revoked the LTN experimental traffic orders. Now, I'm not quite sure if they actually pull back that they've surrendered as it, as it were, um, or whether the ETROs have just run out. Um, uh, originally, the residents were granted a judicial review of the LTNs implemented last year, uh, but now um, the legal challenge has been abandoned because Ealing has uh, revoked the ETR, ET, the ETO or is it ETRO? It's the experimental one, not the emergency one, according to LT, LTT. So I'm not quite sure what's happening there or what will happen. 
watch this space. Um, Camden, uh, Camden Council begin Haverstock Hill, Haverstock Hill cycle lane consultation. I mentioned that before, that is going to be going ahead, at least with the consultation. We hope it will go in as well. It, it's, it would be quite a big extension for Camden. They've got a nice video of what they're doing on school streets. Uh, go to that link and you'll see it on YouTube. Uh, Kenzie and Chelsea, I mentioned uh, before, there's a quick action to do the next meeting of Better Streets for Royal Borough for RBKC, that's the campaign group in Kensington and Chelsea, is tomorrow and 70 organisations, including our my organisation RDRF, have supported, uh, say, Better Streets for RBKC. Um, do, do go to that and uh, send off the email to the council. Um, I and uh, three or four others from Brent Cycling Campaign went to the consultation on the Carlton Vale redevelopment and we weren't happy. Uh, raise again the point that uh, a too successful uh, monodirectional curb separated cycle lanes which have been in for a couple of years are due to be taken out and replaced by a bi-directional where it's unclear what is due to happen at either end of it. So uh, we're not happy and um, we are making further representations, I believe. Right, this is nice from Hackney, cycle lanes on green lanes uh, with wands to go in on them there. Now, the thing you should notice immediately is, look at that, that's where the central hatching was there. So that's been taken out, moving the cars further over, slow them down more, and there'll be some interesting cycle lanes there. Uh, that's from today at the Old Street Roundabout, which is going to be a big change junction. Uh, there's a big, uh, big digital advertising boards, and that was on one photographed today. Cute photo for today. Everybody say, ah, that's nice. And your uh, one more slide, I think, or two. Yeah, here's your quote for today. And I want you to guess who said it. Uh, the clue is that he's got a slightly potty mouth. Let's remember that the 20 minute city, 50 minute city or one minute city are just every city ever for 7,000 years until we brain farted by inventing the car. Time to just go back to the future with action and design, not just catchphrases. So I want you to tell me who that was. Okay, who was it? Alexi Sale. No. Come on. Hand up or unmute yourself. Bob Geldof. No, no. He's someone who does a lot of pro cycling stuff. And uh, chatters have it, Bob. Uh, Michael, 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 Michael Colville Anderson. Yes, that's uh, Michael Colville Anderson. Right. I don't know if anybody got any corrections or queries or anything. I think Roger wanted to come in with one, so uh, or or maybe a comment, Mr. Gaffin. Uh, thank you, Brian. Yes, uh, just uh, um, it's a comment, not a correction on uh, on the on the. Um, Phil Goodwin article you mentioned about taking Grant Chaps's walking and cycling targets uh, seriously. Just wanted to kind of, I, I wanted to write something back to local transport today to explain how come that's happened. Um, just for, uh, to summarize what, uh, what Phil Goodwin was saying, um, the short of it is he, he's just picked up and a lot of people just seem to have only just picked up that um, the government's gear change vision document from last summer uh, tucked away in it was this target to increase um, the proportion of short journeys and towns and cities to 50% by 2030. Um, the Department of Transport didn't make much of a fanfare of, of this little target um, last summer, and nor did, nor did we or the other walking and cycling groups, so Strands and Co. Um, 
And I don't know why DFT didn't make a fun. Of, I, I suspect that DFT's reason for not making a fanfare of it was the same reason that we didn't make a fanfare of it. We didn't know what it meant, and I don't, I'm pretty sure they didn't either. I've asked them, so what is the current level of cycling and walking for these so-called short journeys in towns and cities? Now, Bill Goodwin has provided evidence in his article that he seems to think it's around about 30%, which would have been my guesstimate too. But DFT seems to think it's more like 40%, which suggests that, but they're not sure. They're not sure they have, there isn't a data set that, that they're using. Um, so we don't know where we're starting from. Um, I'm a little worried that their definition of a short journey in a town and city must be somewhat selective. Um, that, for instance, if you drive from near a town or city into the into the city's multi-story uh, into the town's multi-story car park and then walk from there to the high street, that the walk counts, but the drive doesn't. That way, you would get that way. Maybe you'd get nearer to forty percent. But you can see my point that we don't know what the target means which then makes it quite difficult to do all the other things that Phil Goodwin very sensibly says we should be doing, which is saying, so what does this target mean in terms of what would it do to reduce traffic, to reduce car climate change? What do we need to do? What do we need to spend in order to make this target come true? All of which are perfectly sensible questions and we should be doing those things. The very first thing we need to do is find out what, what, is, what, is, the, what is the government's target actually mean? And given they don't seem to know, um, that's, that's as, as it were, that's step one, is get them to clarify what they even mean by this target. Then we can assess, well, is it a really good target, a really ambitious target? Is it too ambitious? Is it the right level of ambition? Um, at the moment, we don't really know. Um, what I would say, uh, Roger, is that if you look at the Joe Dunkley article about uh, Shaps' targets, is there is a graphic there giving some figures on um, mode shares. And I think he's at more at the 30% level. I'll, I'll um, uh, it took me a bit of time to get it, but uh, it's there. Yes, but, it put, but both he and Phil Goodwin are speculating. Right. DFT yes. think it's near stop. 40%. That's the point. It's, nobody knows what DFT right. actually meant by this target. I mean, you could also generate by looking at propensity to cycle tool and seeing if all that's been realized or is it 50% of those that could potentially be cycled or walking is your target, which pretty much puts us about 5% over where we are now. But you know what? We'll, we'll have to see what they mean by that, won't we? Um, uh, David, I can see you've got your hand up. Mr. Harrison. Uh, you're muted. He's on it. I can see him frantically push buttons. We've got a jam-packed schedule as well, so let's let's try and be okay. quick. Just just, uh, just two points. One is about central London. That's a very good new blog by Emma Griffin on the London Living Streets website about walking in central London and how far people will walk, uh, drawing on research by Arab, TfL and others. The second point is, is pavement licensing. Um, you know, the government's temporary scheme that goes on till September. There seems to be question marks in various boroughs about whether that whether those temporary licenses might apply to the the road as opposed to the pavement, and whether people have had problems, noticed problems where um, businesses have been charged phenomenal amounts for suspending parking. Anybody got any responses to that or know anything about it? No, that's 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 a big one. There, I was thinking of having you on to do a proper session with us David and, and get onto that topic because uh, I think there's a lot to unpack there <laughs> big ones um, but yeah I'll, I'll check out Emma's one but like uh, unless anybody's jumping in now um, I've got to crack on with the with the speakers. Got three A speakers yep all good um, Mark do you want to go first yeah fine um, can you hear me all right yeah you're all good oh good 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 um, thank you for having me, first of all. Um, when Bob suggested that I come on, um, he gave me a few topics that he thought I might talk about. Um, but today I think I've got something that um, you'll all be quite pleased with. It's actually the beginnings of a presentation that I'll be rolling out once we're out of COVID restrictions and we go back onto the sort of the circuit doing conferences and bits and pieces like that. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about why protecting vulnerable road users is just as beneficial to the police as it is to the community. 
um, and it should be particularly helpful to those that struggle mainly to get um, their local forces to work with them, either on infrastructure projects or modal shift. And just some ideas you can use and share with your local police force um, and, you know, sort of steer them in the right direction. Um, and why, you know, th there's a great benefit to police forces in encouraging mode or shift, in particular active travel, which I'll talk about uh, from experiences that uh, I and my own force have had. But I'll do a quick introduction first that they don't know me. Uh, those who have had the pleasure of hearing me speak before, I do apologise um, for boring you previously. Um, I am a police officer, I am a traffic officer. Um, I've been in the police now for 22 years. I've been in a traffic officer for 15. Um, 11 of those years of traffic I spent as a 24-7 traffic officer, like you see on the TV. Um, three years on the West Midlands Road Harm Prevention Team, and now I've been on a core motorway world for one year. Um, probably what separates me and uh, the person I did a lot of my work with, Steve Hudson, is, is that we were traffic officers very interested in um, what I call, call traffic work and really reducing demand. Um, so a lot of what we did, you know, and still do has a selfish aspect to it as police officers in that we are all interested in doing less work and ways of doing that. Um, but we found that by promoting uh, modal shift and active travel, we could lessen our own workload uh, greatly, as you'll find out as I, as I carry on talking. Um, first of all, we'll look at why protecting vulnerable road users is just as beneficial to the police as it is to the community. And it's about, for the police, demand reduction. Um, it's a very big buzzword in the police at the moment, demand reduction. Um, doing you know more with less has been what we've been faced with since 2012 and the cuts that uh, the government brought into you know the police service obviously there's been a lot of news around slashing 20 off 20,000 officers and backroom staff and so traffic police in particular which is very expensive by its nature equipment and training wise took a big hit um when you look at vulnerable road use and what demand it puts upon the police uh, regards resources and time allocated to it. it it's very little um and me as a traffic officer i don't get calls you know about vulnerable road users causing issues on the roads um, and causing incidents that i have to attend more importantly um uh, road traffic collision demand wise is, is a hugely expensive incident to attend for a police force resources follow up I mean, you've only got to look at the departments we have when it all goes wrong to understand the costs involved when you have uh, departments dedicated to, you know, investigating serious and road traffic uh, collisions that basically carry the same sort of resources as murder investigation teams. Um, the hours involved are very expensive and the expense of the rest of the community. So for every person that we get out of a car and onto another form of transport, um, it's one less car that I have to worry about on a daily basis, especially at peak times and demands. The other thing is, is when you get people out of cars um, and into uh, other forms of transport, especially active travel, is you have eyes and ears everywhere. So you get a trickle down effect of it, it reduces other police demand as well. The more people you have out on streets and not in cars, walking around, cycling, the more people you have that are basically our crime deterrent. Um, the one thing criminals don't like is they don't like being seen, they don't like being heard. Um, and it really is a case of safety in numbers, both when it comes to vulnerable transport you know, users and the general public being victims of crime. The more people there is around um, actually looking and doing rather than stuck inside a metal box where they're oblivious to everything that goes on outside of them. Um, the harder it is for people to, to commit crime. So the, the more people you have using active transport, whether that's walking, whether it's cycling, whether you know, whether it's on a scooter, whatever your preference is, it becomes hugely beneficial to the police as a result. Um, and these are the things that people forget. And what you need to realise is is that we suffer, you know, unconscious bias and transport prejudices every day. People who, you know, use vulnerable road um, 
transport types. But the police force is a cross section of the community. So you will get um, those same, you know, sort of un unconscious bias traits and prejudices in, in police forces. You've got to really make it attractive to them, you know, to, to support a scheme or to support a certain transport type. And by pointing out these little things, um, it can help greatly. Um, I mean, to give you an example, if you look at, say, um, when a football ground empties um, and you suddenly got up to 40,000 people spilling out onto the streets around, you have an immediately pedestrianised area. Um, the one thing that police forces, uh, you know, panic about is demand. Is this going to cause me, uh, you know, as an organisation, more demand? Am I going to have to allocate resources to it? When those 40,000 people spill out onto the roads around a football ground um, in a totally uncoordinated fashion with no infrastructure and you get total pedestrianisation of the roads around there, albeit only for 15 minutes, nobody ever gets hurt, even though there's lots of people walking around um, because it is a case of safety in numbers. And that's what you really need, to, you know, as a police force, you need to encourage um, if you want to reduce demand around travel, especially active travel. And there's ways of doing that. And I mean, we've done lots of ways, you know, sort of, um, of encouraging. If you look at the things that we've had in the West Midlands, like mode shift stars, clean air zones coming in elsewhere in the country, you've got congestion charges, you've got infrastructure projects, um, bike hire schemes, scooter hire schemes, anything like this is something that really, if, you, if you're going to police smart and police from an evidence-based perspective, things that you should really be saying the right things around and you, you can almost you know sort of make uh cost neutral to the police you know sort of all cost benefit you know demand wise we just saying and doing the right things with very little resources if you look um around some of the things that we've done operation wise and I'll, i will come back i promise and talk about some of these things in greater detail if people need um but things like operation close pass which is the one that's probably always widely known um, 21 hour enforcement that we, we started doing Operation Zigzag, which was around pedestrian casualties at vulnerable locations, um, Operation Safe for Schools, Operation Park Safe, you know, I could go on and on third party reporting. They all really didn't take many police resources at all. Um, and as a result, we saw significant reductions in demand around our KSI rates and bits and pieces like that. So the, the main, you know, sort of theme of what I'm trying to say is that really, if you can get on board with your local police force, you know, sort of um, supporting whatever infrastructure, you know, you want in place, and even with the infrastructures in place, or, you know, whether it's a modal shift scheme, whether it's something like mode shift stars at schools, you've got to really make them realise the demand reduction. Um, just another good example around mode shift stars at schools. Every school in the country has a terrible parking problem. Um, everywhere I've ever worked, every school on every patch I've ever worked, there's always a parking issue, you know, for 20 minutes either side. If you, you know, have, a, you know, a modal shift scheme and you have less people driving their kids to school, um, you don't have the demand regards those parking complaints then from residents, the problem goes away. And then you have less demand because you've got all those people walking to school at key times. Children are, you know, very vulnerable when it comes to being victims of crime. Um, and so you've got more people back on the streets, like I said, and you get a crime deterrence as well. So it's a win-win situation all around. Um, and then from there, you, you move on to policing infrastructure. Now, I know there are a great many people who have joined us today who are involved in infrastructure projects. And for the police, it's really about um, when you have an infrastructure project, it is, you know, it's the holy grail, isn't it? You know, in dedicated infrastructure, you're going to separate your transport types. You're going to take away the majority of the risk. But for that infrastructure to work, you've got to have a policing plan in place. And it's not around the infrastructure. The infrastructure will never go from somebody's front door to wherever they, they are going. You know, you will always have good infrastructure, but you always have those parts of a journey where you're going to have to mix it with drivers. And it's important that if your infrastructure is going to work and 
the police and the local community are going to get the benefits from that infrastructure you've really got to work on that you know how they they access it and so just as an example when we had the blue routes in birmingham uh, before the blue routes even opened we looked long and hard about who was going to be using them where they were coming from where they would filter along to get onto the blue routes um, and how we're going to police it and how we could basically keep them safe so they could access the infrastructure and then use the infrastructure and as you know in have more people using the infrastructure and reduce our demand as a result in the police and so we looked at more like 20 mile enforcement you know around the areas that fed onto the infrastructure um and you know again running operation close pass operations you know on those same things but as with everything what is key is the media has to be right i, I can do a lot of work and if the right people don't know about it um, and the right partners don't know about it and they don't spread the message as well, um, it, it's time wasted for me. Um, so whatever, you know, we do or the police forces that you work with, the message has got to be right, it's got to be put in the right place and the people whose behaviours you're trying to change, which will be those who endanger your vulnerable road users, um, they're the ones you've got to get it to. So you've got to put that message in the right place. And the kind of work that we did, it was really about, you know, finding those right places. And at times, you know, getting a fair bit of negative comments back. Um, but we often took the view that there's no such thing as a negative comment when it comes to traffic policing. You just get a reaction. You get a reaction and you get, as a result, the desired effect because they then take on board what you're doing. They become aware. And unless they're aware, they don't change their behaviour. Um, and somebody who you know reacts, we often say without reaction, there's no traction. Um, it is somebody who will then next time they're in a car, if they've made the fuss on social media, writing letters for a paper about it, next time they're in their car, they will then be thinking about it. it's the forefront, forefront of their brains. And, and that's basically how it works uh, with policing vulnerable road use. It's one of those things that has such great benefit to the community and can also reduce police demand in other ways. Um, if you look at the amount of mental health issues that the police have to deal with um, on a daily basis, anything such as active travel, which improves mental health, and can just take away a bit of that burden from communities and emergency services. Again, it's something that we really should promote and, and protect really as an organization. And so we look to really just, um, this is one of the things I talk about when I talk to all the forces, is, is view transport, especially active travel and modal shift in, in, in a different way that we traditionally have done um, as police officers, as something that you can put a bit of time of effort into, not a lot of cost, but if you get it right, you can reduce your own demand regards our crime demand and our demand on um dealing with uh, road traffic collisions and the demand on the community greatly you know that those things like i said like mental health that people don't associate that the people you know that the police do have to, to deal with um on a daily basis now i know i've said a lot there and there'll be a lot of questions and if anybody um doesn't get what they want out of these someone's just asked me a question bob has got my details and i know he'll pass them on he's been very good as been you know sort of the secretariat to everything that we do um, and have done for a long time. We couldn't have done a lot of what we do without Bob. Um, and I'll just give you a quick update on Steve as well while I'm on here. Um, Steve is still involved in the police uh, at the moment, uh, albeit because of his illness, not in the way that he wants to be. Um, and he says hello to everybody that knows him. Um, and hopefully we can get him on here uh, one week because he's uh, out self-isolating at home. And um, I'm sure he'd like to be involved. He's still got a lot to say. He's still just as passionate. Um, and he's still the person that keeps me in check when I, you know, sort of um, have those ideas and start bouncing them around. So there we go. Um, I don't think there's really anything else that I'd say apart from when you do talk to your police forces, just bear in mind that the one thing they're worried about is demand and back office demand. And the one thing that I will say is if, if you have any interaction with police forces and you want to point them towards me and I can then you know, way lay some of those fears about back office demand because it's always about not what you're doing, it's about what they think you're doing is important. Um, and like I said, uh, for, a, a, you know, giving out a few tickets in the right place and letting the right people know you can have a big behavioural change. And that can waylay a lot of the fears that forces have. And then when you start to evidence the other demand reductions that can have, 
by supporting you know modal shift and you know, um, vulnerable road use then that you can really get them on board and you can usually find the right person as well in the organization somebody who's got that passion whether it's you know somebody who does genuinely care about how people get around and protecting people in the community or it's somebody who, you know who you know wants to make a name for himself and climb up an organization it doesn't matter but you know if you can find the right person you, you can get these things done quite easily um so then um bob uh, that's basically um it for today but that's going to you know sort of like uh there's gonna be a few questions around that so if you want to go to questions yeah brilliant yeah just just want to say thanks mark and you're definitely welcome back here anytime uh, uh i remember in london when we had the the cycle task force and i always quote that around the country as being the changing point for everything in london when wow well, we had police officers that could attend meetings and talk through infrastructure with us so amazing the work you're doing in the, in the midlands I will say, um, I definitely want you back up, but we might have to ask answer most of the comments in the chat because uh, we've still got like a um, at least one more speaker. Well, I'll speak to the one because we run out of time. So, Bob, I'm going to bring you in. Um, well, please be brief. Thanks. Um, uh, and please unmute yourself. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, I just wanted to. Uh, ask if if Mark could just say what kind of operations are carried out because some people don't know there's policing close passing uh, which uh, PC Steve Hudson who he referred to set up with Mark um, uh, that started rolling out from 2016. There's also an operation on mobile phone use, there's Operation Zigzag, there's um, and there's the whole third party reporting thing uh, that's the kind of stuff which has happened. I don't know if Mark wants to say anything more about that now or at another date. I think you might well, just mention them all, but go for it, Mark. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll, I'll just quickly run through them. It'll take me a minute. And what I will say is that I can come back at any time, as long as I'm not at work, and I can do a presentation on each of these individually just to satisfy people. But I'll start with that. I'll do it chronologically. Up close past, like Bob said, 2016, it was rolled out. But we really started testing that in 2015. Um, our first third party enforcement I did in April 2014 uh, using a helmet cam from cyclists. That was, you know, seems a long time now. Um, and then Opt Zigzag is an operation around pedestrian crossings, um, which came about for some statistical analysis we did when we found out that 38% of our pedestrian KSIs happened at pedestrian crossings. And so that's how that came about. It's a very interesting. Um, operation that one is operation park safe is all around parking and obstruction and um leaving vehicles in dangerous position and how we upskill ptso's to deal with those offenses so it spread down to community policing level um operation top deck which is the phone one which everybody knows about on the bus um probably the most prolific and successful um mobile phone operation you know ever uh, been adopted all over the world and and vetted by some countries um, and Operation Safe for Schools, which looked at um, protecting kids on the school run, whatever mo you know, form of transport they took, um, which was particularly effective in changing, um, trans you know, affecting modal shifts at school because we were that um, prolific at dealing with drivers around schools and the way they took their children to school. They stopped driving their children to school and walked instead. So they talk about the adverse effects of you know, doing things differently. But again, you know, it was a win-win all around. Um, so, and there's a couple of others that I won't go into now because time-wise, but again, if you want me to come back, I, I can do a presentation on each of those over the next, you know, coming months if you wanted to, it's no problem at all. That would be magic. I definitely think we could even focus a whole session around it and have you go through that because uh, there's definitely some brilliant projects there. I'm going to allow one more question before we move on, and that's uh, to Roxanne. Go for it. Thanks, Brian. Woo, I'm the winner. Uh, a quick comment and tip from Cambridge. So, hi, I'm Roxanne from Cambridge. Um, we encouraged our police officers to do a bikeability course before they did an operation close pass. Um, and they were able to get funding for that, but we even said if they couldn't, that we would raise the funds to get them that course. And that meant they had a much better understanding of road positioning, why cyclists are cycling in the middle of the road, because there was a perception that it was our fault for being in the way. 
uh, and that made a huge difference to their understanding when they did do Operation Close Pass. So I definitely recommend that from a campaigner's perspective to encourage that. Um, but a question for you, Mark. Um, I went out and did this operation with the police for the whole day. Uh, I definitely recommend doing that if you can. Um, but I found that they, they were very quick to be distracted by anything and everything else that was going on. Someone walked past smoking weed, they had to get him. Someone wasn't wearing a seatbelt, they had to get that. Someone did something else, was parked wrong. It was almost like they wanted to, to ticket people for everything but an operation close pass. Is that what you think is best practice or should we discourage that? I'd be keen to know your thoughts. Right. Um, just go back to your previous point about the bikeability scheme. Um, again, very good suggestion. Uh, Birmingham City Council um, paid for my bikeability instructor training. Um, and I went on a normal, you know, the instructor's course, uh, even though I was a very experienced cyclist at the time, it was something we wanted and actually aided me then when I gave evidence in court, not only as uh, for the cycling offences, but also when we're dealing with, um, I've done statements for our collision investigation unit who are dealing with um, collisions where cyclists have been killed or seriously injured, where I've looked at videos and said, right, the, you know, the cyclist is cycling here because of this. And then, you know, it's a great aid to a police officer to be have any sort of training. Training is expensive. So for local authority, we'll pay for it. It's one of those things that the police will like again. When it comes to your bike, you um, close pass operation and uh, the police being distracted. Let, I'll, I'll explain why close pass very quickly came you know, around. Well, we came around because we did some analysis around our cycling KSIs. And although our biggest complaint from cyclists was close passing, the our biggest danger point for cyclists on the on the road was at junction locations and cars turning across them or in front of them you know that that it, it was it was huge and the point is is that when you do a close pass operation you're looking at making the cyclist the undercover cyclist i call them the undercover cyclist you know which is probably not the the the, the, right, the right term to use but it's what i always use a threat to the drivers drivers don't feel you know uh, vulnerable at any given time um, to anything outside their car and you've got to make them notice cyclists and the way they do that is suddenly pick up on you know a cyclist now if that cyclist spotted them not wearing their seatbelt that person who's been done for the seatbelt offence will then go away get on social media and say that there was a, a copper an undercover copper on a bike saw me not wearing a seatbelt and i got a ticket as a result the person who's walking on the road smoking weed might also be a driver. It might also be a drug driver and they'll go away and they'll go, the undercover cyclist saw me smoking weed and I saw a result, I got a, you know, a small fine on my weed was, was taken off me and I got a street caution. You want the community to, especially the driving community, to start looking out for cyclists because when they do, um, they notice them. They notice them at vulnerable locations. And when they get the idea about close pass, because you will pull over people who commit close passes as well, um, is that they suddenly start changing their driving habits. The subconscious trigger that makes them see cyclists, some people see cyclists and some people not see cyclists and react to them. It will be reacted by them seeing the cyclist as a threat and not knowing that person's running a camera, not knowing whether it's the undercover cyclist from the police and what the consequences of interaction then might be. So although, you know, say on a close pass operation, I'd be very disappointed if I didn't have at least, you know, into double figures people onto the educational mat and, you know, a fistful of prosecutions as well for the ones that didn't react well to the education or were just too damn right dangerous to educate, you know, they, they weren't past the threshold of education. Um, I would also come away with people using the mobile phones, seat belts, you know, sort of I point out, I've had, um, you yeah, know, I've been alongside people with their windows down talking about how they're going back to their cannabis grow and they've got a couple of machetes in the footwell that car was stopped you know they went back to the house and, and found the cannabis grow it's one of those operations close past that does bring up a massive amount of added value for police forces and for every inter interaction you have no matter what that interaction it is it just priorities prioritizes the cyclist and it can be any cyclist thereafter um, in their psyche when they're out in a car and that's what you're looking to do 
basically, um, because I won't bore you now because I can go into the psychology of why some people see cyclists at junctions and pull out and some people don't. Um, but it, it really helps regards keeping cyclists safe and interaction with that undercover cyclist. So there you go. Brilliant, Mark. We we'll definitely, uh, definitely want you back to, to cover all those topics. And, uh, and I'm ashamed to cut it short now, but we've got some real. And, and my uh, quote of the day is definitely without reaction, there is no traction there. Uh, I'm definitely going to use that as my motto from now on. So definitely cause reaction. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to introduce uh, Robert Huxford now. He's going to give us a bit of a history lesson on highway whips. Uh, uh, I think they should be really good. But big thanks, Mark. It's absolutely, absolutely fantastic. Hopefully we get a little bit of time at the end for, for some um, more questions. Okay. Mr. Huxford, are you there? Of course he is. He's a professional. We can see you. Hi, is that? Can you hear me? Yeah, oh, I can hear fantastic. you. Fantastic. Good to go, Robert. Right. Well, um, two thousand five hundred years of roads and streets, road widths and street widths, and other things. Um, uh, this um, illustration is here. If you have a look at that rod thing, can you see my cursor? By the way, maybe you can't. Yeah, yeah we you can. can. There's, a... There's a. It's a. It's a goad. And apparently this was used as a basis of uh, measurement. Um, it's just uh, a little bit over five meters was the standard that was finally adopted. And uh, it was commonly used for measuring up the width of things and the length of things in the, um, in the medieval period. Um, anyway, um, oh, back to the, um, the bug in um, Zoom that you can't get the first slide going. Here we go, off we go. Um, well, I, I just threw that one in because there's a team of 12 oxen in the background, um, quite a, a useful um, uh, haulage unit there, um, and, and a plow. Um, that's basically what I'm going to be doing is um, plowing through some, well, old historic stuff. Um, uh, I don't know very much about this subject, but fortunately um, in the, um, uh, 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 with us this evening is Dr. David Harrison, who does know a hell of a lot. Um, he's author of the, um, his book, The Bridges of Medieval England. I'm one of the few people in the country to have bought two copies of this book, the first one having been stolen. Um, it was in my car, which was stolen. My car was actually valueless at the time. And my belief is that it was, uh, the car was stolen basically for the, um, the acquisition of this book. Um, and in, in this area where I live, part of Kent, there are um, particularly violent and vicious gangs of medieval bridge historians who go around doing this sort of thing. Um, anyway, patterns in towns and villages. So um, I, I'm going to, I think, run up roughly to the, um, maybe the 1700s today, because um, it, <clears throat> it'll take too long to go all of the way. But the what I'm hoping that we can do is um, get an understanding of the, the underlying design code that existed at various different times through the, the centuries and indeed millennia, um, understand why things were made that way, why they were dimensioned that way, um, how they were used, why they were used, how they were changed, how they were adapted. Um, know that that's what we've got now and how best we can adapt them for use today. Um, so, uh, something I did about 15 years ago was trying to do a back of the envelope calculation to figure out what roads, what streets originate from what periods. Um, I'm not going to go into that this in any great detail because it's probably wrong, but it, it'll at least give you an idea that you know if there are I don't know 20,000 kilometres of um, street that have des been designed according to municipal geometric principles, then we can start to develop a range of models for the adaptation of municipal geometric streets to, to meet modern needs. And I, I'd be very interested to hear from any uh, uh, road safety specialists um, about whether there are any characteristic um, accident risks, types of accident risks, accidents that occur on particular sorts of roads. Um, Here's a, um, you've seen this sort of thing before. It's a, um, an illustration of the way London has expand, expanded over the, uh, over the decades. Um, and it, you might be interested in taking a note of that um, reference on the, on the side. It's a, uh, 
it's a, a short paper from Stanford University. It's on the, um, uh, the, the references in the literary canon uh, in the 19th century to bits of London. And it's um, uh, concluded that um, people continue to write novels about places in central London. Um, they tend not to write novels about places um, in outer London. For example, I don't think there's a novel that's been written as yet on Orpington. Anyway, here we go. Um, 1802, I think this map was um, uh, created and published. It's a folding map. Um, it's pretty accurate. Um, if we can zoom in slightly, um, you can see uh, London. Um, you can see arterial roads. Roman roads, um, what would have been turnpikes and other roads. And you can see a heck of a lot of countryside, um, Hackney and Paddington being on the edge of the countryside there and not very much development uh, having taken place on the south side of the river. Um, and now you can compare that with the, with the map today. It's completely filled in. Um, there's the Roman road network um, overlaid. Um, it's very significant, but it's not the only network. Um, and that's it applied over the um, <clears throat> that 1802 map. Um, now, I thought it would be interesting to focus on Walthamstow and <coughs> look at what changes have happened there. So let's zoom in. There we go. That's Walthamstow Church and um, Orford Road, I think, is on the uh, <clears throat> just to the south uh, southwest on the other side of the railway line. Um, so let's go back in time. That's the um, uh, 1802. Um, it's a, a country village. Um, 1864, it's filling up with a few terrace streets, um, some villas, uh, some posh places, um, but still basically rural. Um, 1896, and the, um, you see the, um, <clears throat> The three roads are still there, aren't they? Watch them, they're still there. Um, what's happening is the, the spaces in between the, the three routes um, are being filled in by these Victorian developments. And come 1919, I think Walthamstow is pretty much complete. Um, there's very little change from one to the next. So um, there we go. Back where we started 1802, broadening it out, Walthamstow, 1802, um, it's a village, it's in the countryside. Um, so I thought we'd start off by um, looking at that countryside and where the, um, the roads have originated, the roads and countryside. Um, so there we go, Butzer Hill, when the uh, lockdown ends, Stu Beetle over here, it's in the uh, South Downs, and um, there's an attempt to reconstructing an Iron Age village. And you can see um, a bit of a, a route there. And I suppose this makes the first point, why do we have routes? It's a, um, it, it's a difference in where people can go. It seems to be blindly obvious that, but in many ways it's not obvious. We're talking about two different types of land, one which is restricted and one which isn't. Um, and it's restricted for various different reasons. Um, there were wheel vehicles in that, that period. And um, uh, I, we tend to obsess about the Romans being great road builders, and indeed they were, but um, it's difficult to use these things without some sort of route or road network. Um, and here's a Dejabieg wagon, quite a sophisticated thing. I think it even was equipped with um, needle roller bearings. Um, I'm not entirely sure, but I, I believe there were some uh, original uh, drawings that suggested that. Um, and you get this sort of landscape um, that's attributed to the Iron Age period. So if you go head out east of London um, to say South End, um, this is the Dengue Peninsula um, where um, one of our nuclear reactors is sited. Um, so you've got fields there and a network of lanes that work around the fields. Um, What's the relevance? Well, um, as soon as the uh, urban area starts to expand over this landscape, it, it cements these, these field, 
fields and the lanes that run between them into place. Um, South End in particular, um, worth having a look at that. So um, maybe three types of ancient road, possibly, maybe there are four, but uh, so you, you, there are drove roads. These are long distance routes that um, uh, are used for driving cattle or livestock, pigs, sheep, maybe 20, 30, 40 miles in the, um, in the Iron Age period, not tremendously long distances, um, but it, it's so they could uh, keep the breeding stock in reasonably good uh, condition, avoiding inbreeding. You get um, in the middle panel, you've got uh, straightish roads, um, but with 90 degree bends. And <clears throat> you get those in the Dengue Peninsula, you get those on the North Kent coast. Um, I'm sure Kate Carpenter will have something to say about the 90 degree bends. Um, and on the right hand side, Roman roads. Well, <clears throat> a lot's been said about Roman roads. And what's being moved down these? Well, um, short distances, sheep pigs, uh, geese, and uh, on the top right hand uh, illustration, there's a, a long distance cattle drover. Um, so in, in the um, 18th century, cattle was being driven uh, from Scotland down to London, eventually into Smithfield. So um, uh, you've got this remarkable <clears throat> thought that a, um, a, a, a cow or a bullock or a, that had been bred in the Northern Highlands um, uh, next to black houses where people were living a very, very poor lifestyle. Um, it would have met its end somewhere near Smithfields and possibly um, having sight of St Paul's Cathedral, a gleaming new St Paul's Cathedral, um, one of the leading most dazzling buildings in in Europe and the world and the world as a whole at that time um so it's a site that um the uh, owners the uh, of the the original owners of the cattle would never see um i live in tunbridge and um this is high street tunbridge in 1901 um somebody driving goats down the um down the high street um well Tunbridge High Street, this, this used to be the A21, it's the main road between uh, London and Hastings. Um, you couldn't do that for very long as soon as car use became commonplace. Um, and that's what it looks like now. The, the, the change is huge. Um, it's worth thinking about this because um, these old roads, the three roads, these are the roads that form the borders of the low traffic neighborhoods. Um, they would have been relatively tranquil places um, when they were first created. And now they're anything but. So let's go on to the Roman period. Um, well, there's the Roman road network and there's a, a great map and I forget the website, but it's um, interactive, you can zoom in and uh, they've even got um, the uh, suggestions of the road networks within the street networks, within individual towns. Um, there's uh, Dr. Hugh Davis, who's, who wrote a couple of the books uh, of more on, on the history of roads in general, including Roman roads. He reckoned that um, Roman roads were on average uh, 6.5 meters wide um, on the basis of a sample of 500 principal roads. How he did this, I don't know, because um, boundaries have got a way of uh, varying over the years. Um, it makes it very, very difficult to um, infer how wide things were when originally set out. So um, <clears throat> that, that deserves some, uh, taking that with a pinch of salt. Um, and on the right, we've got the bloke with a gromer, um, a surveying, surveying tool. Um, there was a lot of infrastructure. Um, another place worth visiting is Pierce Bridge. And uh, David Harrison will be going out on about uh, maybe the fourth or fifth Pierce Bridge. Um, this I think is the third uh, Roman bridge across the, uh, and th there are these abutments here. They give an idea of the, 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 width, of, uh, the width of streets and the one way or two way traffic. We can also go to um, mosaics and murals to get an idea of what the Romans were, uh, uh, or the uh, Romanized Britons were, moving up and down the, uh, the road network. 
um, ox carts, and uh, I think those look like asses. Um, and on Trajan's column and uh, spoked wheels, and uh, is that a uh, quadripartite, quintripartite wheel pulled by bulls, which strikes me as being a bit risky. Um, and a reconstruction, and now we've, we're finally getting down to dimensions. And this one is uh, has a track of uh, about 1.6, 1.7 meters and an outside width of about two meters. And you can compare that with the width of things today. Um, the Nishan, Nissan, how do you pronounce that? Kashkai, I don't know. Um, a track of uh, about 1600, a width of 1800, a Sussex wagon. Um, similar this one was built in 1939 um and uh you know so the, the wagons of yore and the cars of today similar widths and um it's only the heavy goods vehicles that have uh, substantially increased on that size but only by a couple of feet um even though the weight is massively different um so let's look at some streets here's rochester rochester high street so i think this was created probably in about would it be 45, 47 AD? Um, because shop owners, building owners, they nick land off the um, off the main way. Um, the width of these medieval streets tends to vary. Um, but Rochester High Street, it's about 8.8 to 12 meters in width. Um, it's also, um, the basis of a, uh, a, a Saxon land charter that was issued on the 24th of April, 604 AD. Um, it's the first use in this document of the word street in the English language. And um, this, this charter, um, it defines a piece of land on which the um, Rochester Castle and Cathedral is, is now built. Um, and street, Rochester High Street, is one of the one of the boundary boundaries of the, the plot. And um, so going back to this business about <clears throat> um, rights of way and places where anybody can go and private land where um, there's restricted access, it's a, that is a fundamental concept. That's a deep concept. Um, and also it means that once a boundary has been created between public and private, land, a public highway, private land, there are going to be armies of lawyers who will try to ensure that that boundary stays in more or less the same place. Um, so let's go on to a, the early medieval period. And um, here's Wallingford. Um, Wallingford, a, a, a town that was created, um, well, partly uh, under um, uh, the resistance of the uh, against the, the Danes, the Vikings. Um, there are. It's a grid pattern. It's about four times the, the site of a uh, one of those classic Roman forts, but built on a similar uh, similar pattern. Um, Wallingford, Wareham, Cricklade, all the same. Um, Oxford may have similar origins potentially, um, but in terms of getting dimensions off this, not easy. Um, the perimeter. Yes, there are. There is a, a relationship between the defended wall and the number of people that were supposed to be protected by this this area. Um, so anyway, let's rush on to the uh, the Norman period and um, uh, the Bayer Tapestry, and also the bottom one isn't the Bayer Tapestry. It's a um, uh, uh, some people that um, finish off uh, the Bayer Tapestry. Uh, it, adding the, the last sequence. And also that, that is a warning to us that um, we can inherit ideas about movement, about roads and highways um, that are not actually correct. Um, so we, we always need to be a little bit skeptical about um, what we read and subject it to scrutiny. And um, it's always doing, worth, I think, doing um, back of the envelope uh, calculations to whether these things make sense or not. Um, anyway, so um, let's go on. Um, and I wonder if Dr. Harrison, are, are you around at the moment? Hello, Dr. Harrison. Oh, well, um, 
Sorry. Oh, there, there you are. Um, so um, we, we've been uh, chatting about medieval highways for a long, long while and other sorts of highways as well. And um, I, I, I think you, you observed that this was one of the earliest pieces of legislation that uh, was reported and um, a, a requirement that uh, <clears throat> roads between market towns should be widened to accommodate 16 mounted knights or um, uh, confusingly, the, the width of two goads outstretched, that's um, about 10 to 12 meters, or um, two-way traffic, uh, two um, wagons or carry um, going in opposite directions. Um, Dr. Harrison, do, do you think these, these dimensions were ever adhered to, ever implemented? We don't really know. Um, most of the cases there are when people block the highway, but there are very few statements of what the width were. But um, what we do have is very good evidence for the width of the bridges, which were usually between about nine and 12 feet and 15 feet in cities. So that would allow two carts to, uh, to pass. But clearly the person who wrote the legates, Henrique Primi, was you know, the laws you referenced, was thinking, um, was trying to state what he thought the existing law was. It's not a statement of people legislating, but a statement of what they felt practice was. And we also know, I don't know if you actually that map of Yorkshire bridges. That's coming on. There's an incredibly dense network. Well, I'll leave you to that. Well, well, um, an incredibly dense network of road. I'll leave it to that. Right. Um, well, I think it, we're about four slides away from that. Um, so uh, just as an example of um, village planning, um, Riseholm, this is uh, about a couple of miles north of Lincoln. And um, in this landscape is um, a deserted medieval village and it's planned out on a grid. And I've put that orange grid there so you can see it lining up with the, the LIDAR boundaries. Um, and then the next slide, it's it placed over them. Um, you can't really see the, um, the, the property boundaries on the northern side of that lane because um, when a rich person took over the land and made an ornamental lake. The spoil from the lake was deposited over them. But there you've got 11th century, what I think the they, uh, archaeologists reckon it's about that time, 11th century, you've got a planned village. Um, it should be able, possible to get some dimensions off that. Um, there's uh, Carenza Lewis, who was um, uh, taking a party around that site. And you can see on the right hand side, um, uh, you, you can see the sort of hollow way um, the centre of the village, the centre centre street. So that would be measured. But unfortunately, when I was there, I didn't measure it. Um, but anyway, there's Carenza um, talking to a sheep. Um, the sheep being instrumental in um, this landscape and the preservation of this village. Um, it, it was the transition from a, a, a arable to um, a, a, a pastoral farming that has preserved a lot of the uh, this deserted medieval village landscape um, and it, it's it, it's worth bearing in mind again that streets and roads are not things to be considered in isolation they they work as part of a larger landscape a larger economy a larger society they're not just objects that that with dimensions they they they're meant to do something um, planned towns um, this is South Zeal um, in, in Dartmoor, and the plots here appear to be about 20 metres wide, which is four rods, uh, four of those goads, and the width in the main street appears to be about 20 metres, but it wobbles around a lot, although I, <clears throat> I don't imagine it would have wobbled around when it was first created. Um, I, I wonder, Dr Harrison, um, the um, Salisbury Cathedral, um, that, that seems to have been pretty accurately surveyed. Will, will we be right in thinking that if, um, when the medieval people wanted to do things accurately, they could do things very accurately? Yes. That was actually, that was a rotten interview question, wasn't it? <laughs> You're not meant to well, a, um, ask questions, the answer to which I, is, can be yes. They also, um, they also laid out a whole new town. So when they built Salisbury, so you've got lots of nice road dimensions there and original plots. 
that you can see what they did when they produced a planned town. But obviously, if you're building these extraordinary cathedrals, which get just get more and more impressive as you go on, um, you can clearly measure things very accurately. And you've got some immensely skilled engineers who are probably more skilled than you know, anyone for a couple of centuries afterwards. Of course, to, to measure things, you, you, it sometimes helps if you can read and write. Um, do, do, do we think the, um, I think these people were called lineatores or liners. Um, do we reckon these people were fairly literate? Who, who used to line out um, uh, these, these planned towns? Um, someone in the team would have been. I, I, I'd like to let, let you carry on. I haven't okay, been, all right. <laughs> well, we're almost at the bridges, so um, let's let's move off of South Zeal. But you can see the curving ends of the of those plots, um, and this is supposed to be caused by um, the action of getting a, a team of oxen ready to turn. Um, you draw the oxen off to the left. Um, <clears throat> then make the turn and come back in the other direction. There are said to be town uh, streets in Leeds that um, have a bend at the at either end that are caused by the, the, the streets being built out over these, uh, these furlongs. Um, well, whether that's true or not, I don't know. Um, Winchelsea, planned town, 1290s. Um, another thing worth visiting there, um, <clears throat> What's called the high street appears to be two rods wide, um, and the, the the streets that go north south, um, they they would have run down to what would have been the harbour, um, the north south streets. Um, so they are a bit wider, uh, three rods, fifteen meters, possibly. Um, medieval traffic, um, we've got pack horses and mules. Um, Dr. Harrison, how how important would pack horses have been? Um, compared with um, carts and wagons? Pack horses were on the whole used when you needed things to be taken very speedily. So they had pack horses taking fresh fish caught in the, on the Kent and Sussex coast to, uh, to Billingsgate and that with teams of pack horses. So you could get fresh fish for wealthy people there very quickly. Um, they're also used in sort of upland country where it's difficult to uh, to use a cart, um, but generally in the Middle Ages, the, the cart was a normal um, vehicle for haulage, um, usually used by horses. Whereas you would only on sort of really muddy ground in say the Weald would you have oxen uh, for for um, for haulage of um, of goods. Um, and I suppose the only other thing to add in that is that the large wagon you showed is a sort of new invention of the 16th century. And that over the 16th and 17th century transforms the way haulage takes place. Brilliant. A uh, couple of mules there. Apparently the British army had at least two different sizes of mules. Um, they, were, they were popular in Burma um, uh, for two reasons. They, they were good at, um, well, three reasons, good at carrying things. Um, they were self-feeding and also uh, they were meals on legs for the for the troops. So so I was told by the bloke who was looking after these things. Um, so from the lateral salter, um, some wagons um, uh, and um, <clears throat> somebody going by wheelbarrow, which is the um, I suppose the uber end of the market. Um, do, do we know was there very much um, passenger traffic of this nature? Um, um, I cannot, I'm not sure what to do. I cannot see the screen. Um, oh, oh dear. Um, it's uh, not just uh, me, or can others see it? We, we can we all can see, see it, see it. Oh, David. Yeah, sure. a, a bit black there. Oh, no, okay. no, no. So, <clears throat> so as, for, as for sort of the, the coach, the history of the coach is that in the, um, in the Middle Ages, those fancy elaborate coaches, which is that what you're referring to, the luxury assault? Yes, right? it's a, um, uh, a princess's um, yeah. in a... Um, it's for uh, very, very wealthy women and they're very expensive. If you're sort of an aristocrat and very old, you might have one and ill and can't use a horse. But essentially the horse is, is what chaps um, and even um, less than aristocratic women uh, travel around on. 
in the 16th century, they reinvent, there's no technical change, but they reinvent the, uh, that, that wagon you see on the literal Psalter in Hungary as a, fashionable, um, as a fashionable vehicle for men. So in the 16th and 17th century, shouldn't they get this big change where you've repackaged it, restyled it, had a great advertising campaign, and suddenly it becomes, it was rather like lager in the 1970s. I remember when I went to university, men would never drink lager. And I came out of university and discovered all over the country, men would be drinking lager. Similarly in the 16th and 17th century, suddenly men decided that they could ride in coaches. They were just packaged a little bit differently than they had been before. So it's not ideas with beer, beers, it's ideas with lagers. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> um, Right, and in terms of our turning radii, um, this particular illustration from the Psalter, it, it, it looks as though the, the, the front axle is not articulated, but were, were these, did, did they have articulated front axles? Could they do a tight turn? Well, they, 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 could, they could turn, um, and they did have the axes which you describe. How tight the turn could be, I don't know. But they, they certainly had um, movable front axes. Right. OK, um, that's good to know. It, it has been suggested that the, um, the width of market streets is, is wide so that a, um, a team of 12 oxen can turn. But when you talk to people who actually handle oxen, apparently they can turn in their own length. They, they just turn back on themselves. So um, it, it's one of these. Um, uh, medieval urban myths maybe um so um more more pictures from the lateral psalter um uh, carts um <clears throat> uh with uh, rather knobbly wheels and um, another cart being um uh, driven by uh, what looks like a monkey or a um uh anyway um i think Another gateways we've got is a, some notion of the uh, maximum dimension that's a, the gateway to council rising uh, town. Um, and now we've got the medieval bridges of Yorkshire um, map. So, Dr. Harrison, it's over to you. Well, what this shows is an incredibly dense network of bridges. So, really, by about 1250, there are as many bridges as there were in 1750 on the sort of eve, eve of the industrial revolution and these bridges still to a very considerable extent form the uh form the nodes of what were the main roads right into the 20th century and to, and to quite an extent till today um clearly the roads between the market towns and the bridges may move a little but you have a road network that is uh that's probably just under a thousand years old that still to a very bit considerable extent survives. Almost most of the medieval bridges were stone apart from on the lower reaches. Some were fabulous uh, pieces of engineering with spans that weren't really exceeded until the, the 19th century. So the people who built the cathedrals built these bridges. Um, it also shows really what a, a a dense network of what must have been you know, of, of, of roads there were in the in the in the country and these are the roads um these bridges really the bridges that taking the roads that went from borough to borough um public roads uh, via regii called highways of course until the 17th century is that enough robert uh, that's good and i see there you've got marked the uh, the bridge at masham which um uh, presumably um if it still exists, um, it would be providing uh, access to the Black Sheep Brewery. Would that be correct? Yes. Um, so is anybody um, drinking Black Sheep products? Um, keep that to yourselves. Um, here's a, um, a, a picture of the uh, a city bridge. This is the um, medieval bridge at Exeter. And there you can get an idea of the, the width. Um, any, anything to say about Exeter Bridge? Um, well too much. The, um, the bridge is built about 1200, so it's the same date as Old London Bridge was. Um, and this 12th century is a sort of golden age of building very long bridges um, in the south of the country with quite small arches. These again all survived, mostly like Exeter, like London, survived in the 18th century. 
it was covered up and then rediscovered when they built that monstrosity um, sort of roundabout bridge over the X, which has completely ruined the whole entrance to, to Exeter. Uncovered, there's a great book about it produced um, by, uh, by the local archaeological people there and, and well worth a visit, but obviously needs now to become part of a walking route into Exeter. Speeding onwards, we've got a, another bridge over the River, River Medway there, and um, <clears throat> one in Crowland. This is a very unusual three-way bridge, and uh, uh, it, it's um, there was originally a, a watercourse that ran through the centre of the town uh, that forked, so um, they created this three-way bridge. Um, something flash, I suppose. Um, so there we've got East Farley Bridge, and um, <clears throat> uh, you can see there it's it's got a single carriageway width. Um, would you like to say anything about East Farley Bridge at all? I would or? like to say about, about widths. Over, over, you know, people often talk about pack horse bridges, but pack horse bridges scarcely exist over, uh, over rivers of any size. So rivers of any size are wide enough for a, for a cart. And, and in, in some circumstances for, for a cart either way. Pecos bridges are really over streams on the whole on, on minor roads. And uh, now we've got Pierce Bridge, bridge <clears throat> the fourth on, on display uh, with its magnificent broad arch. Is. Um, built about 1500 took the place of a bridge with, uh, with five arches. Um, extraordinary testimony to the, uh, the engineering skill of, uh, of medieval masons in the north of England. It, it wasn't alone. Um, bridges in Durham have similar, similar spans um, and, in, and in Northumberland. And this is the sort of epigee, the climax of, uh, of medieval bridge building. And this one takes heavy goods vehicles. I, is that right? There's no weight restriction. I think that's right. It will have been strengthened at, uh, at various times. So the interior, I'm sure, will have been greatly changed. And obviously, absolute determination of the Department for Transport to take these ancient structures and try to shove heavy vehicles over them is in, in stark contrast with what happens in uh, on the continent, especially in cities where many of the surviving medieval bridges like in, in Germany in Heidelberg and Würzburg are pedestrian only and, and bypass bridges are used to take the vehicles. But here the Department of Transport is sort of highway authorities are determined to, uh, to force every bridge into, uh, into commercial use. And, and they've been very slow to pedestrianize. You know, Wallingford has medieval arches, uh, the central bit is 18th century, but that could be so easily for pedestrians and cyclists. There's a bridge nearby. Um, but once again, the county councils show a sort of desperate lack of imagination and determination to keep motor vehicles going everywhere. Well, uh, just come in for one second, Robert. Of course. Uh, and I kind of hate to do this because the last time I had a Zoom call with you, I think we chatted for about two hours afterwards. But um, yeah, we kind of run to the end of the session, in fact, 15 minutes past there. Just wondered how many slides you've got left. Um, we can stop here, if you like. Maybe that's um, an idea. Definitely, um, I'm hoping, like Mark as well, it's the first of uh, many times again. And, and, and I realise I didn't say times <laughs> to anybody, which is shows how terrible uh, a chair I am. Or like, uh, is this a good logical place to go? Are we at the... Uh, at the cusp of a new century of uh, explanation here. Uh, yes, I think. Uh, it, by the way, you know. one one could stop stop there. There's an actual grey screen. I, I think so. The the message to carry uh, away so far is that once you create a route, um, it's there pretty much permanently. Once you create boundaries, they're there pretty much permanently. So it's critical to get get them right. So this this. Um, bridge in 1500, um, it may be a 15, AD 1500 bridge, but it's, it provides the crossing for the Roman road that we call Deer Street.
So, um, what, what, what the, everybody's shouting out for, for like a, a part two with you and uh, and Dr. Harrison to, to come back. So, uh, definitely let us know when you're ready to do that. I'll, I'll let you say a few more words. Sorry, I jumped in there. No, no, that's fine. Um, what, what we'll work up to is taking Walthamstow apart and figuring out what roads were created when to which wits and uh, have a discussion, I hope, as to what can be done with them and the advantages and disadvantages. So it, it gets a, uh, some sort of practical and a 21st century uh, spin. Well, that sounds absolutely fantastic. And uh, I'm sure we'll all look forward to that. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to thank everybody now and I'm going to quickly, and, and I jumped over and forgot Sally. So Sally's going to forgive me and talk next week because uh, uh, as usual, just get wrapped up in what everybody's already saying and forget that there's some kind of schedule to this one. But I will go to Ruth. Ruth, give us a last word. It, that's that's not about Black Death. That's that's for next week, folks. <laughs> um, uh, last, last, last word is any adult, please go cycling with your child because um, when you see adults in parks on foot and the children are cycling, then it clearly means they've arrived by car. Um, and so many children don't enjoy the benefits of cycling with a parent and I can tell you it pays off in dividends and I know we all know this but I just think we have to sell it cycle with your children it's the best thing ever <laughs>